All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Titus Vanderspeck. Um, I'll be doing today's lecture for international marketing. This is lecture five. Um, Mr. Van Weperen or Ernst, however you refer to him in your course, has invited me to come on and do a lecture on the bottom of the pyramid um, to kind of help you understand what that is uh, based on the reading and also to see how that connects to marketing. Um, so I'm going to be doing that today and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so just briefly before we get into the lecture, I've placed little QR codes at the top everywhere, as you can see right here. Uh, in some of the lecture slides, I've done this, and you can use your phone to access those QR codes, and they will open up a link. So for example, this one will show you my LinkedIn page in case you want to connect to me. A little bit of background about who I am. I'm, um, I'm a part-time lecturer at European Studies. Uh, I also lecture at Leiden University and Leiden University College at the moment. And I mainly lecture in startup-related courses to do with social impact. So how can you start a business or run a small business that has a positive impact on society while also making money? That's kind of my area of expertise. Um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, please feel free to get in touch whenever you like, and we can talk about it. Uh, the reading that you were assigned for this week is called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid by Prahalad and Hart. Uh, it's a very interesting article, actually. Uh, really speaks to me as well, uh, mainly because I've been quite active in bottom of the pyramid, mar pyramid markets. So what we're going to do today is just kind of run through some of the essentials of the article and relate it back to some of the theories that you've discussed in your marketing classes. And uh, it's just the, the, the main aim of today's lecture is to kind of um, help you broaden your mindset on the fact that marketing isn't only relevant to a developed world, but also how can it be uh, relevant to lower income markets, for example. That's what we're going to try to look at today. So firstly, a little question, uh, which is essentially, in my opinion, the essence of the article is, is it smart to try to enter low, lower income markets? Is it, does it make us money? Uh, will we be successful as businesses? Will we be able to contribute to society if that's our ambition as a business, if we go to a bottom of the pyramid market? Uh, that's essentially what this article is about. Uh, here's a little quote from the article. The real source of market promise is not the wealthy few in the developing world or even the emerging middle income consumers. It is the billions of aspiring people who are joining the market economy for the under my on my screen, it says for the first time. <laughs> uh, and it's very fascinating to think about that because we're all based in the Netherlands at the moment. Some of you might actually be from countries that have uh, lower income markets as well. Uh, but of course, Holland also has forms of lower income markets. We have to differentiate a little bit between what that means. Um, but it's good to think about, you know, that you, you as an individual, um, you might not be the only market that you can create a product for, right? So what I really like about this is, even though this article focuses on lower income markets, it's good to think, does my product also speak to a higher income market than I've thought about? Or a middle income if I haven't thought about that? Or a lower income if I haven't thought about it? And what is the benefit of actually aspiring to offer products and services to what they call here the aspiring poor? What is the benefit of that? not just for yourself, but perhaps also for uh, the lower income market itself. Uh, does that benefit them somehow? Is it useful for them to have access to certain products and services that they might not have access to yet? It's good to think about this a bit. Um, the income gap between rich and poor is growing. It's another quote from the article. It's, it's, it's good to remember this. Uh, you know, you'll see these videos, uh, you can look them up actually, these videos about the 1% or the 3% of the world and how much they earn and, and how like the 1% owns most of the riches of the world and how the rest of the world own, earns so much less. And you'll be surprised to know that most people in developed countries actually belong to the 3% or the 1% itself. Um, and it's, it's good to think about that and to realize that even when we think of business ventures and business opportunities and marketing our products, because if that is the case, that 1% of the world is the richest, that means that there's this huge market that is not that 1%. And the question is, should we be looking to cater to that 
or not. Uh, the article suggests that yes, uh, the low income markets, as we refer to that, or sometimes bottom of the pyramid market, these are really interesting opportunities for even companies from wealthier countries to look at and to not only look at from a business perspective, so making money for themselves, but also to bring prosperity to developing countries or lower income markets or lower income consumers, right? So I think what Prahalad and Hart are trying to suggest almost is like, we shouldn't overlook this, uh, this, this demographic because what if this demographic is actually a very profitable demographic, but while it's also a de profitable demographic, we can also do some good in the world. Maybe we can kill two birds with one stone. And that's a very interesting market proposition. So question, could the BOP as a consumer group be interested in, be interesting for you or to you? Um, and this is what we've just briefly kind of talked about in the last few minutes, you know, is it, some, is it, a, is it a demographic that you should consider? And I think this is where it ties in quite nicely to the consultancy, the Boston Consultancy Group matrix, sorry, um, which you've used, I believe, in lecture one or two, uh, because it's, it's, it's really about trying to see if that demographic or that lower income market could be one of these four matrices. So, so to try to reflect on that as well in, in the articles you're writing, how that works, how that comes together or not. Um, if we look at whether there is a market there or not, we see that there's certain very interesting developments currently in the world that we need to consider to see if there's a market opportunity in the bottom of the pyramid. For example, uh, there is now increased access among the poor to TV and information, right? I mean, sometimes you'll hear this. Uh, I'm, ha I'm half Bangladeshi and I often go back. When I go there, you know, there's a lot of poorer people in Bangladesh, but they'll still have a mobile phone. So they'll still have access to some form of media and some form of content. Now that can become a very interesting market to offer services, online services, uh, imagine like te medical services, telemedical services, apps for banking that don't exist yet in certain markets. Uh, could be very fascinating, right? It's interesting to think what kind of pro pro products or services could we offer because there's more access to technology. Deregulation and the diminishing role of governments and in international aid. Uh, we see that the aid sector is struggling to still have a positive impact. It has in many ways struggled to have a positive impact on lower income markets. And that presents an opportunity for corporates, multinational corporations, as we call them, MNCs, or even small businesses to enter that space and see how they can actually play a role in a lower income market. Uh, third one, global overcapacity combined with intense competition in tier one, two, and three. We'll get to tier one, two, and three in a second. They talk about that in the article, but I'll explain it in a minute. Uh, but this idea that, you know, uh, there's so many products here, there's so many competitors here in, let's say, a, a, a tier one market, so the Dutch market, for example. Why not look for or try to sell those similar products in a market where there's less competitors? I'll give you an example. There has been a very rapid increase in psychologists and coaches in developed countries like the Netherlands, right? So let's take that as a case example. Let's say uh, you want to start a coaching business or a coaching practice or a psychology business or psychology practice, and you live in Holland, but there's so many people that already offer this service, then it might be interesting to actually develop your business in a lower income market but you will earn less as well, right? So this is also something to think about. And we'll look at this in a little, in a bit as well. The, the kind of, the benefit of, of charging less, but earning more through volume. Look at that in a second. Uh, and then finally, the need to discourage migration to overcrowded urban centers. Uh, if you look at some of the most densely populated capitals in the world, they're usually in booming developing countries. And why that is, is because most of the industry is based in capital cities. And, and that's difficult because often the infrastructure of those capital cities can't handle what's going on. 
Um, but there's also not many businesses for people to work in outside of the capital. So what do you do? What's smart there? And, and multinationals that come from a developed country and try to enter a lower income market sometimes can really struggle to make it happen, to be successful in another market. And it's, it's interesting to think about this a bit, and we're going to go into a bit of depth here, but, but the article highlights a few reasons why that is the case. Um, one of them would be, for example, that their current cost structure doesn't allow them to be profitable in a developing market. What that means is you can't charge the same amount. Uh, maybe you, know, you can't develop a, a TV that has these really extensive features that's like ultra 4K, et cetera, because it's too expensive for that market. So we have to simplify the product. There's a concept called frugal innovation or reverse innovation where we actually take a product from the West and simplify it, break it down, and, and present it to a lower income market to see if they'll buy it, right? So this is, has something to do with the pricing strategy and the, the cost structure of making the product itself. Um, we also see that the poor cannot afford and have no use for the products or services sold in developed markets. So sometimes the products that you sell here aren't uh, relevant to a lower income market. Thirdly, only developed markets appreciate and will pay for the new technology. That's an assumption, right? So we don't know that. And often it's hard to know for a multinational to know whether this new market that they have never entered in will actually appreciate the technology that they have in a developed market. So this is also strange. How can they know that? They are going to have to go there and find out. The bottom of the pyramid is not important to the long-term viability of our business. It's another assumption that multinationals sometimes make that the only good markets to be in are higher income markets. It's questionable. Let's think about it. Fifth, managers are not excited by business challenges that have a humanitarian dimension. Okay? Uh, as, as chief executive of a multinational, we might think so. Um, it's also something to think about inside your company. Do people prefer to make products that have some sort of positive effect on humanity or do they not care about this? That's something that needs to be tested, right? Will it increase employee motivation over time? Intellectual excitement is in developed markets. It is hard to find talented managers who want to work at the BOP. Okay, again, uh, an assumption, but we need to test those assumptions. And I think this article so nicely highlights that we can't make assumptions about a market that we don't really know that well. And that's something that we need to test. Here's another interesting article. I see that the QR code, just gonna move this here for a second. That's the QR code for the article over here. Um, this is a really interesting article about how the aid sector needs to listen to its beneficiaries more or its customers more and that failure to do so um, failure to do so and failure to ask the question uh, why don't we try to understand the voice of those we see can make it very difficult for under us to understand our customer and it's the same with lower income markets if we don't know our lower income markets and we don't know the customers in a lower income market we have to draw assumptions and those assumptions could be wrong and that's where some of this problem lies with multinationals. I'm going to show you a little video that I always like to show that explains how important it is to understand your customer if they're in a new market. Everything I do and everything I do professionally, my life, has been shaped by seven years of work as a young man in Africa. From 1971 to 1977, I look young, but I'm not. <laughs> I worked in Zambia, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Algeria, Somalia, in projects of technical cooperation with African countries. I worked for an Italian NGO. And Every single project that we set up in Africa failed. And I was 
distraught. I thought, age 21, that we Italians were good people and we were doing good work in Africa. Instead, everything we touched, we killed. <laughs> Our first project, the one that has inspired my first book, Ripples from the Zambezi, was a project where we Italians uh, decided to teach Zambian people how to grow food. So we arrived there with Italian seeds in southern Zambia in this absolutely magnificent valley uh, going down to the Zambezi River and we taught the local people how to grow Italian tomatoes and zucchini. And, <laughs> and of course the local people had absolutely no interest in doing that so we paid them to come and work and sometimes they would show up. <laughs> And we were amazed that the local people in such fertile valley would not have any agriculture. And, uh, but instead of asking them how come they were not growing anything, we simply said, thank God we're here. <laughs> Just in the nick of time to save the Zambian people from starvation. <laughs> and of course, everything in Africa grew beautifully and we had these magnificent tomatoes. In, in Italy, a tomato would grow to this size, in Zambia, to this size and we could not believe and we were telling the Zambians look how easy agriculture is when the tomatoes were nice and ripe and red overnight some 200 hippos came out of the, from the river and they ate everything <laughs> and we said to the Zambians my god the hippos and the Zambia said yes that's why we have no agriculture here <laughs> why didn't you tell us you never asked <laughs> So that was a video by Ernesto Ciroli and I found it very profound because it makes you realize how, um, how we really need to listen to our customer essentially in order to serve them well. And that's one of the problems that Prahalad and Hart tried to explain that if you're going to enter a lower income market as a multinational, you have to understand what your customers' needs and wants are. And this really highlights one of the concepts that you discussed in one of the first lectures about ethnocentrism where companies struggle to really take on the mindset and understand the mindset and the value proposition they should offer customers that are beyond their realm of understanding. Right? It's again, something to really think about. Um, but let's work on the premise for a sec second that there is actually a huge potential in the bottom of the pyramid market as Prahalad suggests, right? Let's, let's entertain that thought for a minute. And if we do entertain that thought, then this is a very interesting little graphic that clearly shows how large the potential customer segment is of the lower income market or the bottom of the pyramid market, as you can see, it's the fourth tier. So in the previous slides, we were talking about the first and the second and the third tier. Um, but we also have this fourth tier. Right? So countries like the Netherlands, um, the annual per capita income is typically in the first tier. And then let's say you have uh, middle developed countries or developing countries in the second and the third tier. And then you have these bottom of the pyramid markets, which sometimes are referred to as, uh, you know, uh, demographics where people only earn a dollar a day, for example. That's part of that bottom of the pyramid market. But that's a huge chunk of the population. So should we really be skipping it? And I like the image that they've included in the article a lot because what it's kind of showing is could we flip the pyramid, right? Could we just flip it around and potentially consider that the bottom of the pyramid is actually the most interesting part of the pyramid for us to offer products and services to? Um, and if we, if we think about that, you know, then it's good to think about what, what should companies be doing to enter the bottom of the pyramid. And one thing I think they have to do is, or what the article talks about is to consider quality, right? How should they, do they still have to offer the same type of quality or can the quality be slightly different when it comes to a high, medium or low income country? Um, also margins and high volume, right? So lower prices, we'll charge lower prices, but we'll be able to sell a lot more because the population is bigger, right? Profit margins might be smaller, but again, higher volume could be interesting. 
And because they're new markets, because we don't know those markets if we're a multinational, because we don't know how they function, we're probably going to have to have a longer term commitment to figure that out, to really learn about our customers, to learn how to bring our product to the market, to know where to sell it, etc. So sometimes we might have to rethink how we distribute our product. Um, it's one thing that the article talks about a lot is partnering with various stakeholders to understand the market, such as local governments, right, to get some legitimacy so that local governments help us in lower income markets. Uh, it could be that we partner with an NGO, that we're a corporate company and we partner with an NGO to see how we can work together. It could be that we work with local existing small and medium enterprises or local partners, that we have a local business that's been in a lower income market for ages, that we work together with them. And this relates as well to uh, one of the concepts for marketing that you've, I think, covered about the importance of understanding all the stakeholders in an environment, right? So from your com com customers to resellers that you might work with, suppliers, you might be using totally different suppliers if you enter a bottom of the pyramid market, NGOs, the media itself, how do you actually sell? So this is all stuff that you really have to think about even if you enter a bottom of the pyramid market, just as you would if you enter a lower or higher middle income uh, segment of the market. The concept of inclusive capitalism is mentioned in the article, and I really like this concept. It's very fascinating to think about. So essentially what we're talking about here is um, could MNCs, multinationals, could they play a role in investing their money, their resources, their skills in the bottom of the pyramid as a means of not only generating um, profits, but also generating some sort of positive social impact. And that's what the article refers to as inclusive capitalism. And it seems to be a bit of a trend that we're moving towards, right? Uh, this is an image that I use often to kind of simplify the concept of inclusive capitalism. On the one hand, we're trying to make money up here, <laughs> up here. And on the other hand, further away, we're also trying to have a social impact. We're trying to do good. And those things don't have to be exclusive from each other. Um, and especially in the case of bottom of the pyramid markets, there's a really good case for that. Um, so, you know, the article talks a little bit about how if we were to bring, or if multinationals, forget us, if multinationals were to bring certain uh, technology to a lower income market, or tier four market that could create a whole new plethora of services. I'm going to zoom up in on one of the, uh, the concepts mentioned in the article here, micro banking as an example, to give you an example of a bit of an innovation in a bottom of the pyramid market. So microfinance was a concept that was um, introduced by uh, Mohammed Yunus um, in his bank and his bank is called Grameen Bank. And essentially what Grameen Bank tried to suggest is like, look, most loans that banks offer, um, they're a bit higher. And if someone in a lower income market or a tier four market or a bottom of the pyramid market, these are essentially synonyms at this point. If someone wants to have access to a loan, but they only need a really small loan, like let's say a hundred dollars, $50 even because they want to invest in the tea store they have or they want to invest in part of some buy some equipment for farming but it's simple equipment um, banks typically won't take on those loans because they're too small and they don't make any money off them so he came up with this concept of microfinance which allows uh, people in lower income markets to have access to small loans and he does that by really uh, providing a lot of information about the loans, helping them, helping them pay the loans back to him, and also charging a little bit more interest so that it's worth the bank's while. Right? So this is something quite interesting. I mean, it's, it's a service, and microfinance has boomed since then. 
Another service, this is also an interesting one, um, Danone, which you might know from the yogurts, and they do like milk products a lot. Uh, they partnered up with Grameen Bank to make really affordable yogurt to sell in um, in bottom of the pyramid markets to offer certain uh, nutritions that kids need to grow effectively. So that's the social angle. But they were also able to make it uh, profitable. So they really simplified the product, simplified the ingredients, but still made it attractive, probably used local suppliers to, to make the packaging, etc., to keep costs down and they started selling that yogurt um, and this also ties in quite well with the lecture that you guys did on sustainability where you know within sustainability we're not just trying to have an economic impact we're also trying to make sure that uh, we have some sort of balance with social needs and social norms and environmental needs and environmental norms so this is where the case at the bottom of the pyramid becomes very interesting especially as marketeers so if we're going to try to develop a value proposition for such a market as marketeers, well, how do we do that? Now, the article highlights some interesting things. It talks about that they need to create more awareness. If we're going to enter a market like that, we need to create awareness of the products and services we want to sell. We also need to figure out how we can create access to the market, considering that the infrastructure in that market might be different. We might not have the same um, people that do online delivery or companies that do online delivery. We might not have the same setup for where shops are located. Things might be different. Thirdly, we need to consider the affordability of the product. And fifth, thirdly, fourthly, we need to consider the availability. And, and while doing so, while thinking about that, huh, while trying to figure out how to place the product in a market like that, it's very crucial that uh, this is a quote from the, the, the article. It's very crucial that that new business model or that new marketing model does not interrupt and disrupt local cultures and lifestyles in a harmful way, right? So it's not about trying to push a Western culture onto uh, a developing country culture. That, that would be strange. I mean, that would imply that a Western culture is better in all, in all ways. Um, but what we're trying to suggest here is um, it's not really about whether it's better or not. It's about trying to figure out how to most effectively um, enter that market. Uh, here's a good example of that. Um, so this is a really nice article. There's a QR code for it on top about um, a Bangladeshi guy who actually wanted to do something like Amazon in Bangladesh. But realize that, like, you know, it, Amazon requires certain infrastructure, like good delivery systems in the country and access to, to tech and access to the Internet constantly. And those, those things were not all, are not always present in Bangladesh. So he came up with a different model, which he's actually testing right now, where um, every little village in Bangladesh has, like, these mom and pop stores, right, where you buy all your kind of basic stuff, your daily needs. So he actually decided that he was going to put a catalog, which you can see here, a catalog in those shops where people can buy products from those catalogs, almost like an Amazon uh, e-commerce platform. So you can pick catalogs and you can order them through the mom and pop store. It gets delivered to the mom and pop store and then you take it home. So he's testing that now. That now. So he's working with local infrastructure to try to bring about a new e-commerce system. It's very fascinating. Um, what you'll also notice in some of these markets is if you look here in the shop, you see all these sachets hanging everywhere, right? And these are sachets of uh, soap, shampoo, coffee, tea. Um, it's all on, on the top, just hanging there on little bits of string. The reason products are sometimes sold in sachets is because people work much more with a day-to-day -day income and often want to buy cheaper goods more often rather than bigger goods once in a while, right? Because they earn less and they have less disposable income. Very interesting to think about that. How could you bring products that we take for granted to a developing market by, for example, using a sachet system? Of course, the problem with sachets is that it creates a lot of waste and pollution. So that's also, again, something to think about. And this really ties in really well to the concept of the four P's, 
product price promotion in place. If we look at the previous slide about um, awareness, access, affordable, and available, it ties in really nicely with the concept of, of the four Ps. You know that even within the BOP market, we need to think about the value proposition. So to kind of wrap up, what does it require to penetrate the BOP? And to while doing that, embrace inclusive capitalism. So firstly, if you're going to try to market in a BOP market, you have to be radically innovative with your use of tech and business models. Uh, you need to reevaluate price and the relationship with performance. You need to think about um, uh, how you will measure success. It might take longer. Um, your financial reward might take longer as well. Uh, the concept of scale has to be reimagined as well. Bigger is not only always better, right? So a TV with tons of features that's expensive is not necessarily going to work. You might need to downscale a little bit and reduce features so that you can bring an effective and long-lasting product to that market. And that's it for this lecture. Uh, I would encourage you to think about this as well for your own reports, for your own work. Um, and I leave you with this question. What product would you offer to a BOP market and how? Thanks a lot for tuning in, and I hope this was useful. Thanks. Bye.